James and John's request to Jesus to sit at his right hand and his left is a political move. This is a request for positions of power in what they assume will be Jesus' government. The one who sat at the right hand and the left hand of the kings of the ancient Near East were their chief advisors. Frequently, what would be equivalent to the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense, that is, a general and a diplomat. The assumption underlying their request is that Jesus will establish a new government, that he will be king, and that he will appoint then chief advisors, and that the disciples are in line to be those principal leaders in Jesus' administration. Their tone is then a tone of political begging, of requesting an inside track, and of speaking intimately to Jesus as a way of getting positions of power. Jesus' response is one of variously humor, surprise, compassion, and also of incredulity, that they have not understood what it is that Jesus is doing. You don't know what you're asking. His explanation is to ask them a question, whether they are ready to drink the cup that he drinks and to be baptized with his baptism. Clearly, in the structure of the story, this refers to his passion. And that is confirmed later when in Gethsemane, Jesus prays, you know, take this cup from me. So it is the cup of suffering that Jesus is describing. And the baptism is the baptism of suffering. Their response, still thinking that what he means is, are they willing to give everything for his government, is in effect a pledge of allegiance. You know, we are able. You know, we are able to do whatever it is needed to follow you. And we'll follow you into battle. No matter what happens, we are with you. Jesus' response is still in the context of his recognition of what is ahead. It is, in effect, a prophecy of their passion. Yes, you will drink the cup that I drink, and you will be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. So Jesus recognizes and, in effect, predicts their suffering. But to sit at his right hand and his left in glory, which is his understanding of what that will be, is that in the kingdom of God, that is in the eternal realms, in just as the Son of Man will sit at the right hand of God, this, these metaphors for the relationship of those who are committed to the kingdom of God, who are rewarded in heaven, Jesus is describing then that relationship sitting at the right hand and the left, and that that's not for anyone to decide, uh, but rather it has been decided by God. Well, of course, the anger of the ten at James and John is anger over this clearly blatant effort to promote themselves ahead of the other disciples. So do not hesitate in the telling of this story to express that anger. Jesus is then, in response to their anger, trying to maintain the good relationships within the community of the disciples, and so he is acting here as a mediator and as an interpreter. And so in the telling of the story, you know, gather the audience as disciples and address them in the spirit of Jesus as their leader. What Jesus does then is, first of all, to indicate the overall political context in which they live. 
you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercised tyranny over them. This is a description of the experience of Jews who are subject to the rule of the Roman emperor and of the Roman Empire. But it's also a description of the patterns of power that are present in the nations of the ancient Near East that all of them knew about. It also makes a distinction between the Gentiles as the others and you, namely Jews. And so this is one of many indications in the Gospel of Mark that the audience is predominantly Jewish. That doesn't mean that, it, that Mark excludes Gentiles. It's clearly in the introduction and explanation of the Pharisees' laws, and Mark includes them. But this is an, another indication of the primary orientation of the gospel toward Jews. What Jesus then advocates is that their pattern of life is not to be like that of the Gentiles. That the way in which they order and govern their lives uh, will be different than this pattern of domination. The sign of that is the way in which Jesus himself has conducted his ministry as one who serves rather than one who is served by others. Now, one of the most important dimensions of this saying has been its misinterpretation in the history of theology. The notion that when Jesus says, you know, I've given the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many has been misinterpreted in the tradition. The primary way in which this has been understood is that this is a ransom for the forgiveness of sins in which the ransom is paid to God. That is explicitly stated by Anselm in his book that has been the basis of this interpretation of the meaning of this statement in Mark and others in regard to the ransom. But in Mark, this is not a ransom that is paid to God. It is not a ransom for the forgiveness of sins by God. The framework of Mark's gospel is that Jesus has come to set people free from the power of evil, from Satan, from the structures of evil in the world. Specifically, Jesus has come to set people free from spiritual bondage to the Romans, to Gentile rule. And when he gives his life, he gives his life by allowing himself to be crucified by the powers of this age, specifically the Romans, as a way of setting free those who are bound by the domination of the Roman Empire. There is no place in the Gospel of Mark in which there is the implication that the ransom paid by Jesus' suffering and death is a ransom that is paid to God. In the ancient world, ransoms were paid to the captors. So people who were captured by uh, an enemy army were ransomed by paying the opponent. So also with pirates who captured people in the ancient world. They would be set free by a ransom that was paid to the pirates. So ransoms were paid to the captors. And that would have been the understanding of a ransom paid is that Jesus gave his life as a ransom that was paid to the captors, not to God. So... Uh, it's important to recognize that this story does not support this idea of the ransom for the forgiveness of sins being paid to God. What Mark is about is telling the story of Jesus who established a new government, not by attacking enemies, not by establishing an army and setting up a new government in which there was a 
a new structure of power established by defeating the armies of his enemies. Rather, Jesus was involved in nonviolent resistance to the structures of this age. And in recognizing that that possibility of peace, joy, the gifts of the kingdom of God were present now for those who would choose to follow him.